Hi everyone, it's James here from Production Expert, and have I got a treat for you. Um, we've pulled a few strings, made a few phone calls. Thanks so much to Blake Rogers from East West. Um, we're going to get the behind closed doors tour of East West Studios. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much indeed for having us. Um, it's first thing in the morning, pre NAM. We're running around before the studio opens. Um, before people start making noise and stuff like that. So, sir, over to you. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, as, as I mentioned before, you know, originally studio was built 1933 and was a recording studio since 1960. So it's had a long and illustrious history and I'm very excited to show you all about it. Yeah, so this is Studio One. This is obviously the largest uh, studio we have in the facility. Um, tends to be where we do most of our orchestral sessions, but also large rock sessions and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Studio One is sort of the oldest structure in the entire building. The building itself was originally built in 1933, mm -hmm. um, was originally a grocery market, and uh, become many different things. In the 1940s, it was turned into a casino for a long while where they used to do, you know, not so legal gambling and burlesque shows. This was actually the main stage for the burlesque shows originally. Right. And then in the 1950s, it was turned into a radio production center. So this is where they used to have actors acting out uh, with props doing live radio shows and things mm -hmm. like that. Then at the end of the 1950s, a man named Bill Putnam, which- The legendary the Bill The legendary Putnam. Bill Putnam. He moved out here from Chicago. Um, at that time, uh, he had already started Universal Recording in Chicago, a very popular recording studio facility. He had already, you know, was already an innovator in terms of modern day consoles and uh, echo chambers and artificial re reverberation and things like that. Um, he was also Frank Sinatra's personal engineer. So Sinatra begged him for many years to move out to LA uh, because there, at the time, most of the recording studios were set in New York, ch um, Chicago, and Detroit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was pretty virginal, the recording scene out in LA. So he came out here um, and with uh, financial backing from Sinatra and Ben Cosby, um, they actually, you know, he purchased this facility. Sinatra had his offices here for his label. This was after he'd left Capitol. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he did, Sinatra did a lot of his big work here, like That's Life, My Way, um, Strangers in the Night, uh, New York, New York, uh, Something Stupid. Um, so a lot of uh, The Summer Wind, a lot of great Sinatra stuff was done. In and that here. would have all been with a, a live band. So yep. it would have been in the same room. Yep. On Absolutely. And, and Sinatra, he was very hands on. So, you know, if one per he could hear if one person in the orchestra wasn't doing it right and he would like pour them a, a whiskey and like, okay, calm down, you know. So he was very much involved in um, I don't know where the podium is. It's actually over there in mm -hmm. the corner, but that's the original Sinatra podium. That's been there since back in the day. He used to love to hang his hat on there. There's a lot of great pictures of him at that podium. So you have that Sinatra history. You have uh, like Elvis 1968 comeback special with him, the black iconic, you know, uh, leather suit mm -hmm. that sort of re-jumped his career at the time. Um, tons of pop music back in the day, like Peggy Lee, is that all there is? Um, you know, Barbara Streisand, The Way We Were, um, and obviously film and TV soundtracks. Um, the original Mission Impossible theme song was done in here in 1968. Um, all the music for the Godfather movies, wow. the Rocky theme song. And uh, so, yeah, even to this day, we do a lot of film and television scoring in here. Um, fits about, it fits about like 70 piece orchestras in here. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's pretty versatile space, but but it's the original Bill Putnam design, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, hallways and everything out there, lobby. That's all different. We'll, mm -hmm. We can go into that in a bit, but yeah, this is the original Bill Putnam designs. Um, they've been remained untouched. Um, you know, a curse to anyone who who would touch it. Yeah. <laughs> and it <laughs> sounds know? sounds incredible in here. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah. So a lot of TV and film soundtracks. Um, pop music, uh, you know, Michael Jackson, a lot of, you know, uh, Thriller was done in here as well, like all the, you know, the brass and things, um, you know, even to this day, we have, you know, like Justin Timberlake and, and uh, you know, Foo Fighters and sort of everyone and anyone, you know, has come through the facility in some capacity. So it's like a working museum. So we're in the control room of Studio One, uh, just a tiny Neve console. Yeah. It's uh, it's a well, it's a Neve 8078 80 channel console. 
It's originally two 40 channel consoles. They were put together for Michael Jackson for his album Dangerous. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a pretty big piece of a console, but it's a pretty big piece of a room. So you need a console like this and uh, it's got Gmail automation. It's a, it's a really great classic, huge Neve. Couldn't ask for more. This is Studio Two. Uh, this is sort of a rock and roll room. Mm -hmm. um, has been for many decades. Not originally. Originally, this is actually where uh, Phil Spector did a lot of his wall of sound technique back in the day. Ike and Tina Turner, River Deep, Mountain High, um, and also like you have like Righteous Brothers, Soul and Inspiration, uh, Wayne Newton, Dankeschön, uh, David Cassidy, I Think I Love You. Um, and then a lot of uh, film and TV soundtracks in here as well, mm -hmm. but p particularly TV because Warner Brothers had a contract on uh, Studio Two for a long time. So um, all the theme songs for like the Munsters, Adam's Family, uh, Hawaii Five O, the Beverly Hillbillies, um, the Love Boat, um, a lot of the music for Roots. Um, a lot of that was all done in here in Studio Two. Um, and then, uh, you know, in the 1980s, as sort of the drum sound overall in pop music and rock became bigger, um, this became much more of a rock and roll room. And so in the 80s, you had, um, a, starting in the 80s, you had all the Red Hot Chili Pepper stuff was done in here. Um, all the early R.E.M., uh, Green Day, Blink-182, Weezer, uh, Rage Against the Machine. Um, System of a Down, Audio Slave, a big, Slayer, a big rock and roll drum sound, big rock and roll drum sound, Metallica, um, you know, everyone and anyone, as I said, more in the rock side of things, but it's this room has a particular drum sound, which is really famous. And there's actually a drum booth in the back, but as I said, by the 1980s, people were taking the drums out of the drum booth and putting them in the sweet spot in the room. And so now we use that for, you know, piano recordings, the, the booth. But yeah, it's, it's people come from across the whole world just to get the drum sound in here. Now, sadly, well, not sadly for the studio, they've got a session in at the moment yeah. and we can't film in there because obviously the setup's done and um, not everyone is happy with us taking cameras around and, <laughs> and rightly so. So um, Blake's going to sort us out with some stock footage of the studio so you can see exactly what it's like. Um, but trust me, the view from here is spectacular. <laughs> So obviously, the, the inside, the, the studios themselves are, are separate structures. Yeah. But just looking up, the roof and, and all the kind of, the actual building itself is stunning. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's original 1930s barrel design ceiling, um, very classic Hollywood design. Um, there was actually originally a second floor here that, that was taken out. Um, you know, the sort of story behind all that, you know, is it, it was this was Western Recorders back in the 1960s and then went through various different name changes and things like that. Um, but when we took it over uh, in 2005, we brought in the designer Philippe Stark to come in mm -hmm. um, in order to redesign the lobby and the artist lounges and the kitchen and things like that. And he agreed with us that we do not touch the rooms themselves. We don't want to touch the history. don't want to change the sound at all. So everything that we did, you know, was only at these the lobby and all these other areas, mm -hmm. you know, because when we took it over, there had been uh, uh, a lot of water damage during the period in which the studio was closed for a bit. Um, so uh, this was all like a coal mine. It was just, everything was already ripped out. Right. So, you know, we had an option, spend a lot of money to try to bring it back to sort of a sort of pokey 1960s offices or to really expand it and sort of bring the history of the studios into the next century. And so that's what he really did. And, you know, his whole idea about this was, you know, we have the studios, they're sort of the five jewels. Um, and so we're gonna create this amazing jewel box for them. And, um, and he wanted something that was very playful, um, something that encouraged community, mm -hmm. uh, because that's something that, you know, is sort of getting lost a bit in modern day home studio setups. And, and so uh, it forced people to interact with each other. Um, but there's still private lounges and things like that. And the design, you know, is sort of this, uh, almost like an Alice in Wonderland through rock oh, and roll. It's stunning. It's, it's you know. very plush, very lovely, lots of nice tactile materials yeah. and stuff. It's just beautiful. Yeah, he wanted sort of rock and roll palace. And as I mentioned, because we're a studio that we've always been a studio that does multiple genres, you know, orchestral, rock rap, you know, all the above. So he didn't want the studios to be too reflective of one thing or another. So there are elements of 
you know, jazz and elements of rock and, you know, the sort of acid queen vibe with the green cubes, you know? Mm. So he really wanted something that was sort of cool and inspired creativity. And you have even like the chalk uh, walls. So that, that artists, you know, they write different messages on the walls and, you know, we save some, we erase some, take pictures and keep them. But, you know, so it's an ever evolving kind of uh, creature in and of itself. So obviously you are a commercial facility as well. Yeah. But as the, the name would suggest, East West, I'm assuming this is where all the libraries are done or a large chunk of the a libraries? A large chunk of the libraries are done here. Um, all of the Hollywood Orchestra series is done in Studio One, um, Pro Drummer and things like that, Studio Two. So yeah, we are, as, the, as East West obviously take advantage of the incredible history of these rooms, um, depending on what the project is. So, you know, uh, you know, obviously Studio One was perfect for the scoring and because we actually you know have the building itself we were really able to spend you know months in there recording it that's not a, the true when you record a, a sample library in a concert hall where you only have like maybe a day or two you know mm -hmm. so we were really able to do some unique stuff with that library and uh but as you mentioned you know we take up a tiny little bit of the recording time in the, in the year so it's mostly outside commercial work and uh and we meet fantastic people that come through the studio in that way. And we ended up, we usually end up collaborating with them on libraries as well. So, you know, it's a win-win situation and two, the two sort of entities feed off each other. And East West, the sample division is yeah. based here as well, aren't you? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So knowing my music and pop trivia as I do, this is a fairly important room in rock and roll history. Absolutely. This is uh, legendary Studio 3. And uh, this is the room, well, this is the Beach Boys room from back in the day. This is where the Beach Boys did all their work. Um, California Girls, God Only Knows, all the pet sounds was done in yeah. here. Um, so, you know, fantastic history with that. Um, but really in the 1960s, this room was sort of the focal point of that entire 60s counterculture sound. So you had the Beach Boys in here, you also had the Mamas and the Papas in, the, in here. Um, they did Monday Monday, California Dreaming, Dancing in the Street, um, Mama Cass, Make Your Own Kind of Music. Um, you also had like, you know, uh, Scott McKenzie, if you're going to San Francisco, mm -hmm. um, or the soundtrack from Hair was done in here. Um, and then just these, some of the really great, uh, you know, acts from back in the day, like the Turtles and the Association. Uh, you know, a lot of the people that uh, met and worked in this room, um, brought in by like people like Lou Adler and things like that, uh, you know, they went on to, you know, be in the Monterey Pop Festival and organize that and everything. And then after Monterey Pop Festival, Woodstock. So literally the seeds for that entire 60s counterculture Bedded in this room, very small room. It's actually the smallest room we have in the in the facility, but it's just I don't know. It's just something about the sound of this room, especially for vocals, and uh, um, it's just fantastic. And then you know, going on to the 1970s, you know, you like Dolly Parton, Nine to Five, um, 1980s, you have like you know all the Blondie records like Heart of Glass and Rapture, um, and to this day, you know, a lot of pop stars still in this room: Jennifer Lopez, Ariana Grande, Selena Gomez. Justin Bieber, Frank Ocean, Lady Gaga, you know. You there's, name it. there's a real, it sounds so cliche to say it, but you walk in here and the hair on the back of your neck just yeah. goes, Zing. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, as I said, it's uh, once again, Bill Putnam, who's a genius. Now, this room itself, you can tell by the door we just went through, was originally a meat locker right. in the grocery market <laughs> days. So, um, Bill, you know, he was a genius, but he was also very practical, very frugal. He literally just took material and converted, you know, the same spaces. But he just, you know, the knack he had for understanding acoustics and how to, you know, subtly change aspects of the room in order to, you know, change the nature of the sound. I mean, that's something that people really didn't even consider that much before Bill Putnam, you mm -hmm. know. The first acoustic designer, but without really, he generated a whole field of yeah. studio design. And, you know, as I said, you know, we have all the original echo chambers throughout the building. Uh, he was really the guy that, like, brought the echo chambers and artificial reverberation into the modern day, you know? So, um, and then you have things like this piano here, 1959 Steinway, this is the oldest piano we have in the building. Um, wow. Very fantastic, great sort of dark jazzy kind of tone to it. So um, just a fantastic room, you know, as you can see, no isolation. 
you know, so you either overdubbed everything or you embraced the bleed when everyone played together. And on albums like Pet Sounds, that was intentional. He wanted things to bleed into each other's mics, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so, and there was a lot of experimentation on that album. In fact, great movie um, that was made about this, um, the Beach Boys here and making Pet Sounds in this room, uh, Love and Mercy, came out two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you, they came in here and they recreated all those Beach Boys sessions wow. from back in the day. Um, so definitely check that movie out. You can really see how that album came to being, which very experimental album. Don't know if you remember, but it actually flopped the first couple of months and it was a disaster, you know, and then it started gaining all this notoriety and it became like a cult thing and then it you know nowadays we look at it it's like oh yeah pet sounds one of the great iconic. albums yeah, but yeah. you know that album went on to push the beatles to do sergeant pepper you know and paul mccartney will even tell you that himself it's like i heard that record and i was like okay how are we going to one up at this yeah. you know so they had a friendly rivalry beach boys and the beatles sort of pushing each other to do better work than each other um uh, so the, the pet sounds control room yeah absolutely and uh, the very, very special, unique board. So tried an A-range. Very, very, there's probably only about four or five of these guys left in the world. I would say this one is definitely in one of the best condition out of, out of all of them. And then they only really commissioned about 12 of them from back mm. in the day. Um, was originally at Trident Studios in London. Um, and so a lot of great stuff, you know, the Beatles White Album, a lot of David Bowie, you know. Queen. Yeah, Queen. No, the opera was mixed on it. Um, so a lot of fantastic stuff. And then Console went to uh, Cherokee Studios here in LA for many years. Um, then more great stuff's done on it. A lot of Rod Stewart, the Cars Candio was done on mm -hmm. it. Um, and then um, it went to a studio in Massachusetts for a number of years called Longview Farms. Aerosmith worked on it out there and other, other people. Um, but by the time we bought the console, which was about like 2009, um, it was already in pretty rough shape. So we brought it back across the country and we spent a whole year just fixing it all up, fixing all the wiring up, putting in these knee flying faders into it. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's, it's in really great condition, but it's a very cool vintage analog the, console. The Trident you know? A-Range EQ is completely different to anything yeah, else you will absolutely. ever use. You know? I mean, you talk about like, you know, tape machines and how they add, you know, sort of color to recordings a console even a console like this adds a, a certain t characteristic tone to it you know and um you know so yeah we do a, a lot of different kind of sessions in this room but you have to know what you're doing this is not a console that you can sort of fake knowing it you know um it's a very old school and you have to know know your way around it because you know we certainly have people that come in and they're like oh i i can handle anything they come in and they walk right back out and they're like no i'm, I'm gonna need an engineer for sure <laughs> <laughs> so very special very unique so studio five um a totally different sounding console, a totally different vibe of a room as well. Absolutely, yeah. This is uh, one of the newer rooms, and by newer, it was originally constructed in the 1990s, first as a mix room, and um, and then a number of clients had it for a number of years. Then about three years ago, we sort of took the room back and, and put in this uh, SSL G+, and sort of you know, made it, you know, commercial ready again. And uh, yeah, so it's a pretty much more of a modern day kind of room that you see um, a lot of these uh, newer studios where larger control room, smaller tracking room, mm -hmm. you know. And this tends to be where we do um, a lot of uh, the pop and hip hop and, uh, and uh, EDM stuff in here. Um, it's got custom Augsburger uh, speakers with massive subs below. Them. So I was going to say, yeah. you know, just just the small monitoring rig in here. Yeah, exactly. In the other rooms, we have ATCs, and they're really good for, um, you know, they're really precise. Um, but in this room, this is where people want that sort of deep bass. And this is also the most isolated room from all the others. So this is where they can sort of crank, crank it, it up. up and and, uh, yeah, and then just, so, so the, all the other rooms have analog consoles. Uh, this is SSL. I mean, this is newer, but once again, it's from about you know, mid-90s. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, really good G+. Plus. Uh, what's good about the G+, Plus SSL, is that it's really good for both mixers um, in r rock and, you know, film and television. But it's also, as I said, it's also really uh, used and well-known and uh, by people in the hip-hop and pop and EDM and what have you. And it's a very different sound to a Neve, isn't it? I yeah, mean, but it's, yeah. but it's it's not wrong, it's not different, or it's not wrong, it's not bad, it's just 
Different. It just, just is. <laughs> and uh, as I said, smaller, you know, because uh, mostly we just do vocals in the room there. Um, people have, you know, sometimes put drum kits in there if they really want a very tight sound. Uh, in fact, a lot of the early Muse uh, um, uh, albums were done here at the studios in all the various rooms. And they were even in here in this room and put a drum kit in there to get a very, very, very tight sound. Cool. Yeah. So, Blake, thank you so much. Um, it was a whistle-stop tour, but worth every minute of it. Thank you so much again. Thanks to the team here at East West and everyone who's helped, who's basically looked after us today. Uh, my name's James Ivey, and I'll see you again very, very soon for some more Gear Talk.